Menahan. Welcome to Talk Cosmos, the show where Sue Rose Minahan and her panel of guests bring you insightful conversations to awaken consciousness for soul growth. Come journey with us through astrology's energetic cycles and get ready to understand your path in the cosmic roots of the stars. Hello, welcome to Talk Cosmos, and this is I'm Sue, host and founder of Talk Cosmos, and today is the 14th of April. We've moved past the eclipses, and we're heading on to another major event, and that's the focus of our talk today. It's when Jupiter and Uranus, the big, the biggest planet in the solar system, Jupiter meets up with Uranus, and it's expansive and it's authentic. It's asking us to reach into our self or our identity for many reasons. Other planets are at play. It's not just those two in the team. They have a whole crew working on their behalf. And you might say Venus, who also is very related in mythology to Uranus, it's a whole family affair, you might say, in that regard, is has her say. She's wanting our values that are deepest within our core to speak and also about the wounding of our past. We might have a long past. Our memory might be short, but how it feels and what we must experience can have many layers to it. And of course, we know that when we're all healing and working on our finding that self that we need to listen to, that authentic self that Uranus shatters away with this electromagnetic field to say, hey, Let's get real down to what you are and use that material because we're here always for a purpose. Venus is also about purpose. And in fact, that relates me quickly to the fact that we have a guest who used to be with us all the time. That's Leslie Francis. And I won't say more because we have an introduction that we'll be ready for in a moment. And she does purpose, soul, soul, purpose astrology, along with our psychologically oriented spiritual astrologer, Laura Tad, Dr. Tad. So we have a great crew tonight, have many, many thoughts, and I've spoken enough, so we are now ready for Planet Buzz. Focusing on perspectives of pattern planet cycle relationships and understanding their archetypal energy consciousness, reflecting through history, current events, mythology, and philosophical questions, these are the members of Planet Buzz. I am Sue Rose Minahan, founder of Top Cosmos since 2018, an evolutionary astrologer and student of vibrational astrology, a consultant, workshop facilitator, lecture speaker, writer, Dwarf Planet University graduate, charter member of Kepler Astrology Toastmaster Club, hold an AA degree and Associate of Fine Arts Music degree and Certificate of Fine Arts and Jazz. I'm an artist, musician, mythologist, and pursue esoteric philosophies. I'm Leslie Francis, host of my own podcast, Coloring Outside the Box, and official astrologer for Female First, an online British magazine. The author of the 2019 and 2020 Llewellyn Sunsign books, I am a professional astrologer, intuitive, and lecturer, both in my own country of Canada and internationally. My lifelong search to understand what it is to be human led me to develop my own approach to astrology, purpose-centered astrology. I passionately seek to support people in their greatest act of creativity, living life, through writing, consultations, and webinars creator of star cards, my own deck of oracle cards, I love talking and making people laugh. And I'm Dr. Laura Tan. I work as a spiritually oriented psychological astrologer with students and clients around the world. As a counselor, writer, and educator, I love helping people recognize their inner strengths, take advantage of auspicious moments, and navigate times of challenge with greater ease. On my own podcast, Mythic Sky Storytime, I discuss astrology, mythology, and actualizing our full potential. Learn more at mythicsky.com. And as the ancient hermetic code reveals, As below, so above. As above, so below. 
Well, and here we are in the middle. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Welcome back. And hello, Laura. So good to see you both. Yeah. It's good to be here. Here we good have, time. yes, for folks to get a hold of Leslie, go to Leslie Francis, her name.com. And for Dr. Laura Tad, mythicsky.com. Although I know if you Google her name, you will find Mythic Sky and myself at Talk Cosmos. Jupiter and Uranus, it's a 12 or 14, 13 to 14 year cycle, longer than Jupiter. It's 12 year because as you pointed out, Laura, you have to get past, otherwise it would be going around like a, a treadmill to itself. And the most recent one was in 2010-11 in Aries and Pisces, and the next one's going to be in Cancer. And I, I guess I'll review this, but you know, speak up if you have a thought. And Laura originally did some uh, research about it, which I extended further because I want to know more details and figure it out. But the truth is, is that in Earth, of all the elements, there are the very fewest conjunctions by far. It goes in... Uh, the most would be an air and fire. And then Leslie pointed out, well, gee whiz, and that's my phrasing, that if we looked at modern rulership, Uranus is Aquarius, that's air, and Jupiter is in fire, it's Sag. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting. So, and then it goes water and earth. However, in retrogrades, and this is fascinating, that's not the case. Which, again, if we think logically, if we're trying to come up with a pattern, and we are talking Jupiter that wants to know about beliefs and patterns. So I, I think this is an honest approach for me. But Earth and fire have the fewest retrogrades. So not only does Earth have not very many conjunctions, but there are not very many retrogrades. And fire, which one can, when you think about it, perhaps when earth is so stable, so to have retrogrades wouldn't be so easy for anybody. And when it does happen, perhaps that very meaningful. And in fire, it's instinctive. It doesn't want to go back. It just wants to go forward. So from that aspect, it, it makes sense. When it does happen, and I'll show it in the next slide, it's over a long period of time. And if you know about astrology, there's various cycles that actually start like our lunar nodes. They start at the the last degree, 30 or 29, and they go all the way back over a long period of time to zero. Well, this is the case. And it's approximately 600 plus or minus. We'll just put that. And this perhaps illustrates it a little bit better. Over 2,000 years, going back to 100 common era till 2050, I was hoping that would give a stretch, and it does. It's Obviously, these cycles, if we really wanted to get intense about it, would show patterns that were bigger. But the point is that the first time it showed up was in the Dark Ages at 600. And it, the Nick, interestingly, in May of 684, not only did it approach our degree of the, and I know I'm jumping here a little bit, so pardon me. I'm not trying to give you all this facts. You can see it um, for those people that want to review it and go back. But it was at 23 degrees, a conjunction between these two large planets. And the nodes were also in Aries, north node in Aries. And within orb, three degrees. Three degrees is, for some people, large. But for many people, that's within orb. So I am going to compare that at the end. But as you will see, it tr they transit in this long period of time up until 1181, when that was the very last chart for that cycle. And then the next one began in 1858 that is in the next 600-year cycle that we have. And uh, I'm grateful that Laura brought, in her own research, brought those up because we are going to look at these charts and they have significance. So archetypally, this is the 
Jupiter and Uranus and in Taurus. Shall we begin about Jupiter, Laura and Leslie, just sure. about its archetype? Okay. Yeah, well, he's right. That Zeus in the Greek pantheon, for people that are more familiar with the Greek pantheon than the Roman, right? So Jupiter is, and it's the largest physical body that we're aware of anyway, um, in our solar system. And so there's this grandiosity, right? Jupiter does everything, doesn't know how to do anything little. <laughs> um, and, and so there's always this expansive, larger than life energy that Jupiter brings in wherever it's engaging or however it's playing out. Um, and Right. Remember years ago when I first started studying astrology, there was people were saying, well, there's no such thing as a bad Jupiter transit because Jupiter's luck. Right. But it can be too much of a good thing. Right. Like over expansion, over indulgence, that that's where there's the real shadow of Jupiter is, is that part of it is, is, you know, um, over the being overly optimistic, being so big picture, so optimistic mm. that we're not realistic, right? That's similar to the shadow of Sagittarius. And, and so we have some of that, that, and it's a 12 year cycle, right? So it's been, it's been in Taurus for almost a year now. It's almost out of Taurus. And so we've been in this Taurian over overindulging, particularly in Taurus, of physical, right, people being vulnerable to overspending or sort of thing while Jupiter's been in Taurus. So that's just that as its own archetype before it's come in contact, you know, that it on the 20th of this month, um, its engagement with Uranus, which is mythologically, right, his father or grandfather. Um, yeah. And... Um, and the dance that they're going to do, that they have this meetup, right, of this 13, 14 year cycle of coming back to one another, um, which then, of course, also brings in Saturn with it. Saturn being that 14 being part of Saturn's 7, 14, 21. Ah, yes. Right. There's a, there's a component to that, that Saturn, who's the father of Jupiter, son of Uranus, is right. Mm -hmm. That's all part of this mythology. And thank you very much. One factor, there's two factors here I wanted to bring up, actually a couple. One is, is that Jupiter is a shape shifter. Now, I never thought of that so much, but I was reading that and realizing, of course, in every mythology, not every mythology, but so many, Jupiter begates children with mortals because came as a swan and therefore we have the uh, the Gemini twins, or else it came in as a horse, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that is part of its whole very powerful involved with it. And it's a king of the Olympian gods, because as you mentioned, there's these other gods, and I'll we'll go ahead with who they were prior to this grandson. And what really impresses me when I discovered that. Ju with Jupiter ruling, we have free will. You know, we have choice. In other words, humans can make their blunders. I remember reading Odyssey, and that was one of the factors too. You know, we're we're not, in a sense, that's with Saturn that he, that uh, Jupiter overthrew was very role oriented and order and and authority, which can be so useful, but yet it doesn't have that innovative an experiential life that would need both of your psychologies and purpose-centered <laughs> astrology that you do. Well, well, Jupiter doesn't really like limits. Mm. And like most, all fire signs, does not necessarily like the word no. And it's not comfortable at all in Taurus. Taurus is um, the energy of Taurus is just too grounded for all that magnificence, right? All that joie de vivre, all that anything is possible. Um, and it's always interesting. I, I mean, thinking about Uranus was the father of Saturn, who is the father of Jupiter. If you think about that in terms of consciousness, 
that there's always got to be space and place. Like it's like <laughs> it's like I just got this image of Saturn kind of hanging by his fingernails all the time whenever Uranus and Jupiter show up. Mm. And what's going to happen when they show up together and um, bring about, you know, again, a huge shift in consciousness in terms of what is real, what is, what is it that you can truly call upon to provide any sense of grounding and so much of Taurus sense tends to view outward because it's very much connected to the physical world. For us as a sign, I always think of it as a plant that's just poked its head above the soil going, okay, which way now? Yeah, how do I survive? Exactly. Yeah. And so the roots, it always hangs on to its roots. And so for me, this conjunction asks us to ask ourselves, what are our real roots? Because the roots of a plant are hidden from view. They're not obvious to us unless we dig the plant out of the oh. soil. And, the, and then unless we plant it again, it's going to die. Oh, I so love there is a shift and a change in terms of, of expanding our, our awareness. And yet you take a look at some of the conflict going on in the world. And we still want to do right, wrong, good, bad, either or not. How do we look at this in a, in a in a big picture kind of way, which I think is part of this Uranus-Jupiter conjunction? Can you get outside the immediate response and and view it from um, what came up as outer space? But I think that's a bit much. So no, in fact, well, thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Laura, Doctor Tad. That's gorgeous. I'm going to hang on to that hidden view, having our roots. Um, we have here Uranus with the two of them, the great awakener. Oh, I was knowing, I was reminded that Saturn thankfully is in the ocean, in the water, Pisces. So Saturn actually, I think with this transit this time is part of cooperating in its own way. It's most interesting It's dissolving some of its, uh, process, but I don't know if process is the right word. Uranus, the great wakener and visions, you know, looking at visions, it's a longer 84 year orbit around the sun. And if we look at his physicality, it rotates on its side uh, in reverse of all the other planets. Venus also goes, rotates in reverse, but it doesn't, not on its side where its axis is east west. And it is a primordial deity, unlike Saturn, which was a Titan, and Uranus, which is the Olympian god. You know, Jupiter. Jupiter, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So Uranus came out of chaos. It's, from, it's primordial. It's one of the very beginnings. And it's a personification of the whole sky. And uh, yeah, well, and I think, you know, often, you know, Richard Tarnas often can, talks about Uranus in comparison to, in terms of myth, that it's often more akin to Prometheus in terms of what we as astrologers tend to ascribe to Uranus in terms of that rebel with the cause and um, revolutionary, unconventional, cutting edge innovative right that that's very much part of prometheus's story and so yeah you know that merging of that rebel energy that from that that awakener vision energy then with jupiter right that we have going on now so this expansion it can it has potential to be aha eureka moments going on mm. that 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 is there the taurus i think does complicate it because as yeah. Leslie was saying that root it's like well awaken and innovate but keep your feet on the ground somehow simultaneously I think, I think that tells me we need a tall tree because the seba tree and this is going further ahead but the seba tree down in Guatemala the roots are in the ground and we're the people are the trunk and the heavens is, the branches are up to the sky 
And in a sense, that's where we're reaching for. Uh, Leslie, you might have something to say. I know that we, I'm trying to move on too, because I'm so appreciative of the archetypal, which is very grounding for what we are going to look at these charts ahead, but moving along. Because it is, by being a great awakener, revolutionary, right? Rebel. It, it isn't working with the rest of the team. It's like in, authentic to itself. So, let's well, it, 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 if it is the primordial deity that emerged from chaos, as you say here, well, he doesn't have to play with others. <laughs> That's it. There you go. Unless he wants to. God and, and Laura, I really did appreciate that stuff about Prometheus. As a person with a stellium and Aquarius, I intend to think about that for a while. <laughs> so Taurus, we can't forget Taurus. And the important part also about Taurus is that there's dis depositors, dispositors. And Venus, the ruling guide, however you want to term it in astrology, is rules both Libra and Taurus. And Taurus, as you indicated, Leslie, is about survival. You know, the spark, the fire has entered, broken away from the womb in Aries, and now it's landed, it's an earth sign, it's fixed, and it's rooting as great analogies and truthfully being, and it's self-reliant, and it has resources, both material and internal. And yet Venus... It, it, a larger scope of Venus is values and purpose and beauty. It's beauty, which really with the Fibonacci and the spiral of life and the golden mean rules a lot of creation. But she's going to have her say. She is strong in this chart, not only as the ruler, but in also in a conjunction when we get to the charts. Shall I yeah. do have... Okay. I mean, there's a lot we could say, but there's also a lot to cover. So I know. Laura, you brought this up, the Sabian symbol, which is always rounded off from the degree. So we're talking about 21 degrees Taurus. So we're looking at 22 degrees Taurus. Do you want to speak? Yeah. To so I was just curious. I don't always use the Sabian symbols, but I thought I would check out what this one was. And I think it's a really beautiful expression of what we, what to express expect or what this may be about particularly given the state of the world right now and trying to hold this as the vision of it because you could go very dystopian with some of the stuff that's going on and so this is a way of not sort of falling into that abyss or rabbit hole right so the sabian symbol um a white dove flying over troubled waters right and so this idea of like things are complicated there's a tumultuousness and yet the dove is always associated with peace right and so it's the symbol of world peace and and so this idea of okay yeah things are are stirred up things are complicated but there's this hope this light at the end of the tunnel right or it's very biblical right of like oh well noah the dove coming back with an olive branch is how they knew that the great flood was over, right? So there's this way of, of having some hope of resolution of the, of the troubled waters we may find ourselves in. And I liked what James Burgess, because there's, for, for those people, the Sabian symbols from Elsie Wheeler and Mark Edmund Jones in 1925 have been interpreted by many people. And of course, Dane Ruchar is a very, popular and, and we a go to for understanding what they are, which I have written here. But James Burgess is also a student of Dane Rujar and and Zhong. And I like the idea that he expands that idea of the dove, which has its biblical essence, which I think Dane speaks of here, into just looking at spiritual signs mm -hmm. that really we are talking about and it, the whole chart in my mind, with Saturn in Pisces and other energies here with Neptune, as we see, are really asking us to go within to find that center and for the signs through the physical. And it says here that the larger life rhythms indicate a picture and give 
signs all around us. I love that. Leslie, do you have a thought before we pause? Well, I just wanted to say that I think that, that you know, um, we do have to be a bit careful. We haven't got to the chart yet, but apparently I want to say this now is to remember that Jupiter has a tendency to be a little bit self-righteous. I know all the answers. Ah, very and, and Uranus can tend in that direction as well. So uh, for different purposes, but it it's important for us to, to stop and think and recognize that because we see the world or feel the world or experience the world in a particular way doesn't mean that everybody else sees it that way and that there ought to be some mutual respect. And maybe that's because Venus is the dispositor of this particular conjunction. Mm -hmm. Yes, and she says it's heart-centered. Very good. And looking at this chart, this is the one in Washington, D.C. representing the United States. Should we take a quick sense. break, Sue? Before well, no, we we're going to wait. We're going to wait. We have a minute. Thank you. It's uh, at 27. We got one minute. Uh, at It's at 1027. I'll just introduce this. It's at 1027 in the evening on the East Coast on the 20th of April. And there are quite a few, not too many, but there's a potent T-square, meaning that's an activation. There's an opposition. There's another activation. And there's a sextile. So what you'd indicated there is with the nodes, if we just look at the lunar nodes, there's a stellium in Aries which is our pioneering going forth. It's like this chart right off the bat wants us to move ahead. And how are we doing that? We have some great ideas like what are our real roots or what's our real purposes, how to decipher this energy here. Do you, Shall we stop there? Do you want to take a break then and come back? Yeah, to I this? think that's it's good to take a break then. Okay. Now and, we'll, and we'll dive in. We'll be right back with Leslie Francis, Dr. Laura Tad, and myself for Planet Buzz, authentic, ex expansive authenticity with Jupiter-Uranus conjunction next week. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. While we take a break from this week's edition of Talk Cosmos, let's take a look at this cycle's archetype. We are currently in the period of Aries. By leaving a cycle based upon completion, the energy of Aries sparks initiation, creating action to separate into a new cycle of life. It's a fire sign, which means it will involve great emotion. And because separation may create resistance, it also takes great courage to break away to new ways of becoming. This is Martha Norwalk. Every Sunday morning, beginning at 9 a.m., thanks in part to the Ananda Institute of Living Yoga, we cover the world of animals. This week, April 21st, it's Behavior Training and Healing Sunday with me, and talk with your human or animal loved ones on this side or the other, and personal awareness coaching with Natasha Venter. Hope you can join us and plan to call in with your questions for either one of us. Martha Norwalk's Animal World, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. to noon, right here on Alternative Talk, a.m. 1150. Talk Cosmos brings insightful conversations to awaken consciousness for the soul growth with hour-long programs every Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific on KKNW. Talk Cosmos weekly programs are also available to watch live on the Talk Cosmos YouTube channel and Facebook page. While you're there, make sure you click the like and subscribe buttons so you get the full Talk Cosmos experience. Or if you'd rather listen to the show archives with audio only, the entire podcast collection since 2018 is available on most podcast carriers. And to find out about upcoming programs, sign up for the newsletter at TalkCosmos.com. So grab your coffee, tea, or kombucha and enjoy the show. Get your daily dose of variety. Alternative Talk, 1150. Okay, at this point, I'm going to try to find where it is. We've got so many. Ah, here we are. This is just a brief little break till we get back, right back to say that Leslie... Francis and Laura Tad and myself. I'll just start off with our announcements. Next week will be about the United States Chiron return with 
Michael Bartlett, John Chinworth, and Justin Crockett Elsie. So tune into that. And of course, thank you everybody for subscribing and being in touch. We are on a YouTube channel and podcasts. And Laura, what would you like to bring out for the public? Uh, yeah, so I've got a couple talks coming up. One on June 12th. Um, it's going to be on family dynamics and astrology and looking at the patterns that show up in our families that and how that can help us understand. You both get patterns and then you get families that are the outliers and how mm -hmm. looking at those can help understand your family of origin or working with your children um, and where there's similarities and where where there's really radical differences, right? Like everyone in my family is fire and water except for one person, right? He's the, the Aquarian who's already an outsider. Is that even more of an outsider? Because he's the only one who's not fire or or water, um, sun sign. So we'll be looking at those sort of things. And that's going to be with Andrea Getz program through Moyer Press. So if you go to my website, you can register or you can contact Andrea to register there. Beautiful. Um, and then, mythicsky.com. Yeah. Go ahead. And I'll be doing another talk for them on the 10th of July uh, about how to work with dreams. And we'll be doing some dream work. So oh, that'll be fun. Wonderful. And Leslie, Master Astrologer, and that's at lesliefrancis.com. I know that you're the president of the Edmonton Astrological Society. You just did a talk with them last night, which I imagine people could get a hold of or join your club. But what do yes. you have news to tell um, us? Well, first of all, <clears throat> if anyone's interested in checking out our organization, um, you can go to astrologyedmonton.com. Edmonton is the city that I live in, in Alberta and Canada. And not only am I currently president, um, I did a lecture two days ago on the moon and her inner resources, taking a look at the moon, the, the planet, the moon conjuncted just before birth. And the planet is going to conjunct after birth as a, as a focus for looking at inner resources and pathways that the moon will follow. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I am also head of the organizing committee for the Canadian Astrology Conference 2025, uh, which will be held uh, September 12th to 15th in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And for all the lovely Americans listening, you have to just check out how well, how much you can buy with a U.S. dollar in Canada. Oh. Anyway, uh, the theme for this conference is Healing the Planet. And we're hoping to announce our keynote speakers um, sometime in the next two to three months. So people have plenty of time to get their uh, stuff organized so they can join us. Uh, we're very lovely, friendly people. <laughs> so uh, we promise you'll have a good time. Oh, and September will be a good month. That just sounds spectacular. And I I'm in the process of sometime this year launching um two new podcasts uh coloring outside the box i think has come to its natural and i've had some personal challenges which have meant i haven't been paying attention to because it just didn't really have the energy so i'm planning to do one called things i learned from falling on my face <laughs> i love it i'm sorry to hear and it the, though and the other one will be called astro soup Goody, goody. Well, we'll look forward to it. Thank you, Leslie. And myself, here, we're going to go backwards. We have so much to cover. Wow, we, but we are going to somehow get through this. So here we are. We have this stellium in Aries on the North Node where we know that that's where the planet's headed is northwards and that's where our destiny is. It's a lunar, we're, we're just going to talk some facts here and as much information as we can. And Venus is collaborating with Chiron, our wounds, in order to figure out how are we going to do this so we don't get in our own way, right? That's one way to look at it. 
And if you want to pick another one, we'll just plow on if we can. I pardon the word plow, but we do need to kind of keep forging yeah, well, in Aryan fashion. Mm-hmm. Point out before we switch charts, because one of the things that is interesting about when we cast a chart for the states or for Washington, but so looking at it as sort of that being the U.S. as a whole, right, as we get this Sag rising, so then Jupiter is governing the chart and for this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. Um, yes. And so even though they are at the exact same degree, Jupiter is a bigger player in the states than in other parts of the world with that conjunction, um, which we then saw. And rise. we do. And Laura, you're absolutely right. And yeah, and that was the next slide. So I'm going to show it right now that, yes, for the United States, there is a difference. And with the East Coast, it is. Jupiter and for the West Coast, it's going to be Venus. But interestingly, they're both so aligned with this con- because Venus rules the Taurus. And as long as we're at it, we may as well jump to Canada. Canada is also a Sagittarius rising. So, in other words, Canada, with their capital in Ottawa and the, the United States, both are ruled by Sag. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So, just looking, and then I don't know if you cast the one for the UK. Interestingly, for the UK, we got the Aquarian rising. And so then Uranus for Europe then, or at least the UK, is becoming, is a bigger player. And so they're both, both of these planets, really important for really significant parts of the political world. It Um, is. And that, it's just an interesting way that that, how that's lining up. Astrophotography. With with all of that. and. That there's more of a Uranian quality to it in in Lund- in England, uh, you'd still get some of that Aquarian rising in part of the continent of Europe, um, and and then in the states. And so this is a very significant conjunction, um, and we'll see how it exactly plays out. Um, you know, initially I had had some. I was trying to a little little dystopian, but like I was, con- I have some concern about seismic activity with this conjunction. I don't think that that I think that's part of the eclipse, you know, impacting the quake that hit Jersey a week ago. Um, but when I looked at it historically, I wasn't seeing anything about big earthquakes. There was other really there, significant things, but well, I didn't see anything about earthquakes. Let's um, just stop, Laura. Let's yep. pause on some of that. Let's stay with what you brought up, if we can. And that is how this conjunction is working just briefly over the world a little very powerfully, but with a little bit of different emphasis, okay? Because I have charts that show what we've talked about, but they're further ahead. And I want to go back to the original chart Mm -hmm. also. So if we're all on the same page here, because we have so much material and it's like, how do we logically step here and there? And and a bit of chaos with Uranus is fine. I mean, that's what we're normally done. But I love this idea that you all of us know because and I'm going to work backwards in Europe that has the Aquarian that's networking. I mean, it's there over in Europe with, as we know, politically all the troubles there in the middle East. So they're networking with the rest of the country nation. I mean, the world you could say, and also in their environment, they're concerned. Then if you go back to, Washington, D.C., we're trying to get the right philosophy. We're our belief systems, and we're trying to adjust our belief systems to go along with the right program and to be righteous as, as, as along with Canada, because if we go back here, Canada, too, has at the very beginning um, the, the, the Sag rising. So if we go back even further to the coast, this is fascinating where the the East Coast is, as we're bringing up Sagittarius along with Canada, looking at our capitals. But on the West Coast, whether it's Seattle or going down to Los Angeles, it's Libra. And that energy is looking at relationships. And what's the relationship between, you know, we're at a distance, we, I mean, the West Coast there. And it's looking at values and other factors, but all, but Isn't it amazing, I think, as you brought out, as we're all bringing out, that this 
conjunction is pretty pivotal for how the politics and our attitudes or belief systems are going forward. Um, yeah, well, this the ruler of Taurus, right, that Venus is then also at the degree of the eclipse. So there's layers of this, right, that, of the it's, solar eclipse that we just had. Um, so that's right, I, 19 maybe, degrees. You know, and but again, this revolutionary energy meeting up with that expansive energy in Jupiter, but in Taurus that can be stuck in the mud, bull that won't be moved, right? That's part of that Tory. So this like having to almost it's a force isn't quite the right word because that's more Saturnian, but there's this being catapulted out of where we are stuck potentially. Ooh. I love that. And it, that introduces these other aspects. And then we can move on, which I know we're all eager to do. But the sun activating in this tension motivated drive with Pluto, and Pluto's pretty ruthless. I mean, ruthless in the sense that it wants soul growth and it's going to purge anything that isn't giving fit, necessary growth to us. So that's going to be eliminated. But our sun wants it. I mean, in other words, that's on the very strongly activated here. And then of course we have that other opposition with the moon. The sun and the moon are doing their own activity here. Leslie, do you want to bring that up with the moon as it's opposing Neptune and of course Laura too? You don't have to. I'll, I'll just keep going. Well, I, you know, we had a lengthy discussion about this before the show. Uh, and the moon is technically void of course, although, you know, you can argue that it's applying to a trine to Pluto. It, so it has to change signs. So there could be some, well, what came up is some deep emotional rumblings. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. And, and but it also could be that somehow we're being asked to um, take emotional reactivity. You know, in other words, we get highly reactive emotionally. I mean, that's a sign of cancer. And it, to take that kind of out of the picture and really just respond more from a deep knowing as a, that moon trying to Pluto bringing us, you know, following our feelings, not our emotions. Because for me, those things are different. If mm. what you feel is not different, not necessarily the same how you respond to how you feel on an emotional level. So, you know, perhaps void of course moon means that we kind of can open ourselves up to a new beginning because we're almost there. But the moon's at 29 degrees and 29 degrees for me is always that push pull one foot on the brake the other foot on the gas pedal and it's in earth so it amplifies that need for us once again to take a look at the structure of our lives and ask ourselves if the structure of our lives actually supports who we really are as opposed to you know we just built this because that's what you're supposed to do it wants to fix things in virgo as we know and i think yeah opposing neptune it's looking at visions and how are we going to activate it? So of course those questions are useful. And Laura, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to say that, you know, the opposition to Neptune, maybe, you know, maybe it's time for us to stop gaslighting ourselves and <sighs> be honest and truthful. <laughs> With the real truth, please stand up. <laughs> Do you remember that show? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, yes, me. No, not you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I like that idea of distinguishing between emotion mm -hmm. and fe like feeling being how we express the expression of emotion as it, right? There's this different, and maybe because I have a moon in Virgo, I like differentiating that. <laughs> mm. Well, no, I I totally get it. I used to worry and wonder, how can you tell the difference between, I mean, to me, I was 
air and, and, and but I had another friend that you know both and we would sit there and wonder emotions and feelings what's the difference and yes it's I now I've evolved to understanding what you say but it's oh. They have just to give an example so people under so a feeling is like so if you feel unsafe what is your emotional response going to be right. you either go numb you either run you fall you, you start trying to people please you fawn or you freeze and those are emotional responses i'm talking about how you how you yeah. express it so um yeah yeah right. I yeah. had something else that yeah. it, it disappeared. Well, it, yeah, just think about it oh, from I'm a sorry. language, right? That we're the language of like the word emotive is right. That's an act. Being emotive is yes, right. And Thank so you. versus yes. like feeling action. versus emotive action. Emotive is an yes. action. Yeah, um, this is very, good. which is very different than like how you feel is not necessarily how you express how you feel. Right? You can be angry and appear shut down or you can be absolutely and get depressed. Yeah. You know, I mean, or that is one of the definitions. Be sad and depression. put on a happy face. Yes. The show must go on. <laughs> we know all this. And so, yeah. So with, I mean, that does speak to some design. of this no, piece of your, one of the things your is governing authenticity, right? And yes. so being our authentic selves, valuing our authentic selves with it in Taurus, getting oh, record and and feeling like our authentic self is valued. Yes, I love it. We are going to go back to the three most recent of the few conjunctions in Taurus with Jupiter and Uranus. So the last one was, and this is just a review, and then we'll go into the charts. 1941, and it was at 25 degrees. Remember, it, the interesting part about this is that in 1858, it was at the very beginning of this 600-year, more or less, year cycle that where Taurus will have its few conjunctions, just to remind people it's not very often, relatively. And it, it, they progress from... 29 degrees onward. And in 1181, there was this 677 year break, which is pretty extraordinary. It was at the very end of that, of the previous cycle. So this is information that we can find out a little bit about. I'm hoping not to get too elaborate with these because we want to move on, but they're so interesting. And, uh, just choosing here and if yeah. maybe we should start with 1181 because that was the end of the past one and laura you brought up the fact that saint francis assisi was born and i realized that our i'm not catholic thank you and i praise those that are but the pope that in current popular life today chose his name to be saint francis of assisi and this quote here, the man of poverty, of peace, along with our dove, right? Of the well, and he's the, he's the patron saint of animals, which is yes. how ours governs. So, and, um, yeah, and he, so he got this conjunction in his birth chart. He's a living, and he was a living embodiment of this conjunction. Yes. So, it, so it, your microphone changed. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's an interesting way that it, because of that cycle ending was he, he was birthed as the cycle ended. And now we're kind of having, a, and my point was to show that the follow through in some cat way of how it's moving forward. But the other thing back then, and I took a great deal of time researching this more because it was all of this is like news and how related is it? is that the Japanese and the Chinese astronomers that were wonderful astronomers still and very meticulous in their own findings of looking at the skies, observed that there was a, a new star, as they call it, a visiting star, a, a, a guest star, they called it, in the constellation Cassipedia, which is like that W that turns around from a W to an E going around, but you can also find the North Star if once 
looking at astronomy. But it lasted 185 days, but it started here in 1181. And fast forward, in 2013, it was understood that these were white dwarfs that were dying, but they also realized that there's these different kinds of dwarf planets dying, which I won't get into. It's a, you Google it yourself, folks. But the fact is, going more recent, 23, um, it was further discovered that the photograph of these, in other words, that's not that far away from right now when we're having 2024. You know, it's sort of a segue. In other words, this idea of the astronomy, and it's showing what they're hoping now with a photograph of it, more about the origins. Thank you. Uh, Uranus, about the chaos of how the universe gets started. So it's kind of abstract, but it, it's showing that we are reaching like Gaia and, and Uranus, you know, Earth and mm -hmm. heavens. Yes, that's all. So 1858, why don't you bring that up, Laura? You Sure. Did you have about. the chart for it or no? Yeah, I do. And then I guess we'll mention that it, 1941 was also with Pearl Harbor. And of course, yeah, it's when it. Pearl Harbor at the end of that year is when FDR greenlit what became the Manhattan Project. Um, and, and so that seemed very interesting because what it, it like perfect expression of Uranus and Taurus and splitting the atom seems like a pretty perfect analogy. Um, yes. <laughs> but um, so that- I'm not sure I have 1858. Maybe I should just jump ahead and we'll see what we do have. But so will... 18, the Lincoln's speech, what I was reading was it's one of three of his most famous speeches he ever gave. And he gave it before he was president. He was running for Senate at the time. And what he talked about in his speech, and the whole speech is available, you can download it. It's called A House Divided Will Not Stand, is the full title of the, of the speech, um, is that the issue of slavery in this country had to be resolved one, it had to be one direction or the other. He wasn't even professing that slavery should be outlawed or that it should be universally allowed. Mm -hmm. The argument was that the duality that was happening in the United States, where some states allowed slavery and some states had outlawed it, would be the end of the country, that there needed yes. to be a single law or the U.S. would not survive. Uh, and uh, that was his speech to run for Senate. Yeah. Um, right. But I will and it's so just interesting when we look at what's going on in this country yeah. currently, because we are in a similar, the degree to which things are polarized in the United States right now, there's a lot of echoes of what was happening in the 1850s. Right. I will mention, though, I because I, I looked at that and I read the whole darn speech, which was a long speech. But and the synopsis is that he actually was voting for no slavery, but he w did bring up it's got to go one way or the other. And he was casting Douglas as the guy that wanted slavery because he had done that. So it was a bit more biased, but he was he, your point was, hey, we got to make one way or the other because it's going to fall otherwise. This is good. This is 1941, the last one. And what is so interesting, look at Pluto. They oppose each other. It's now in Aquarius. It was in Leo then. The other thing is, because I'll jump through this, is the moons also are very within a few degrees of each other, right over the node. And of course, as you had brought up, that's where that other phrase was about hidden things that Martin Luther King brought up that I didn't read, but people can read, is that Leslie, you said Antitian of Aries, which is a south node. So this moon now has the shadow side of what perhaps people were thinking of being so aggressive at that time, but the shadow side of it. So we're needing to fix it, right? Oh dear, we can't be that way. I'll say that in 684, it was interesting. There were kings and rulerships shifting powers all over the place. And as you can see here, there's a stellium that people can look at. But the Buddhists say sorrow is inevitable and suffering is optional. So 
So back to Leslie's questions here. What basis of our being of a past needs nurturing? What pains can we share of our wisdom's love? And you can look at some of these questions further about series. And we didn't even bring her up, but she wants us to nurture ourselves. So, my goodness, Leslie and Dr. Tad, thank you so much. Onward, everybody. Be your authentic, expansive, true self. Thank you for joining an insightful conversation on Talk Cosmos, the show where Sue Rose Minahan and her panel of guests awaken consciousness by connecting soul growth patterns with astrology's energetic cycles. Be sure to tune in next Sunday, 1 p.m. Pacific time, to continue your journey through the roots of the cosmic pathway.